recording on. Hello everyone, this is Rafi, and today I'm here with my friend Amber. She's in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm in rainy northern Portugal as always. Hi, Amber. Hello, it's snowing here. <laughs> oh, that sounds way better than rainy, rainy streets. Have you, have you had a snowball like. fight yet? <laughs> Not yet. I just woke up with this and it's morning here. <laughs> okay, this is the first uh, snow of the season or? There have been a couple of snows. Boulder's funny because it will snow and then it'll disappear. Where I'm from, mm -hmm. it snows and then that's it. It stays that way the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, where I'm from in the, in the south of France, we usually get a couple of, of days of snow around 600 meters of altitude and then the ski stations above a thousand, thousand five hundred start to get snow all year round. So where I, where I used to, to grow up in a, in a mountain house, I'd get snow for a few days a year and have to, you know, jump on uh, basically in a big trash bag and, and bomb down a hill, basically. <laughs> nice. Those were our sleds back then. So, yeah. I'll take full advantage of the snow when I can get it. <laughs> and talking about snow, actually, that's, uh, that, that makes me think of um, a cold uh, thermogenesis, which makes me think of SCD1, which makes me think of linoleic acid and Brad Marshall. <laughs> ah. so, so let's see what we, we come up with in that train of thought, because um, as you've probably seen, uh, uh, Brad Marshall has been talking about SCD1 and it's this sterol coedesaturase uh, enzyme that converts um, um, fat, uh, saturated fat to monounsaturated fat. And that this is a very important signal, uh, uh, according to Brad, I would say a fattening signal, uh, essentially. So the question is, uh, how true is that? And if it is, can we intervene on it pharmaceutically, do you think? Or do you know, maybe? Because I have a very peripheral understanding of all of that. Well, that's an interesting question. I have been doing some research kind of on the side, preparing for a post I was going to write about it, but I haven't completely formulated all my ideas about gotcha. it. And, and of course, even when I formulate enough for a post, it'll still be just one little tip of that iceberg, because I think mm -hmm. there's a lot there. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess what he has, what he initially brought to light in his early writings about it was the idea that when, that when you inhibit it, at least in animals that we've experimented on, it, it profoundly prevents them from getting fat or, and reduces their, their fat if they were already mm -hmm. obese, which is, which is really interesting because, um, well, like you said, all it, all it does I don't know if you said this, but mainly what SCD1 does is converts uh, saturated fat into monounsaturated fat, right? Yeah. And so how, how that is solving an obesity problem is not really clear to me. There seem to be a few possibilities. Mm -hmm. Like one of them is that just the burning of monounsaturated fat itself is, is more it's less satiety inducing and therefore causes you to eat more. And so there's that whole line of reasoning that the more saturated fat you have available, especially if it's in your adipose tissue, so it's what you're drawing on on a day-to-day -day basis, then the more mm -hmm. saturated it is, the better it will be for your leanness. Um, but on the other hand, it, it could be that there are downstream effects that, that aren't necessarily directly related to what you're burning. So you would expect, if it were about burning monounsaturated fats, then a, a diet that's full of monounsaturated fats would do the same thing. And I'm not sure that we have that. Like if you give someone right. a diet very high in, in oleic acid, is that going to compromise their satiety? I'm not sure that it does. Do you know about that? Not that I know, but I think um, Brad was pointing to um, a molecule called OEA. I can't remember the actual uh, full full length name of it. Um, that was triggered uh, after the consumption of dietary monounsaturated fat, and that that could explain why the dietary intake uh, isn't necessarily as problematic as as the mechanism would otherwise have you believe. That was my right. understanding. 
Mm-hmm. So, but I think the main, the main mechanism and uh, symptom, I guess you'd call it, that he points to as um, increasing his, his trust in the fact that it's increasing, increasing his total daily en- energy expenditure is that it increases in coupling uh, protein, induces thermogenesis, and that, you know, this is something he can feel basically verified taking, uh, I think it's berberine and some other compounds, CLA, uh, I think will will help in that as well by reducing acidity. Right. So, so what I he's think taking that's what he is pointing to. What he's taking for his own personal experiment right now is stercolic acid, and I don't yeah. really understand why that inhibits SCD one. But one one thing mm-hmm. that I've been looking into is palmitoleic, which mm-hmm. is itself a monounsaturated fat. In fact, it's a product of SCD1. And so what I think is sometimes when there's, so there's this enzyme and it's generating products. If there is a product that comes out in a small amount, like palmitoleic acid, then if you give a, a lot of that, it will, it will give the impression that you've already done all the work that you need to do. So, mm. I mean, the biggest product of SCD1 is oleic acid. And you might think if you eat a lot of oleic acid, it might also inhibit SCD1. I'm not sure whether it does or not. Um, mm-hmm. But the palmitoleic acid, since it's a very small, a much smaller quantitatively, I think that might be why. And conjugated linoleic acid, like you mentioned, CLA, also probably has this property. So we've seen, um, I guess for commercial mm-hmm. reasons, we've seen a lot of... Uh, promotion of the idea that CLA is going to be great for fat loss. And it's, it, it seems to me now, having made all these connections, that if it does, it might be also because it's showing up as, hey, scd one has been working hard, so you can downregulate that now. I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, it's certainly interesting. I, uh, I, I also have a lot of uh, uh, questions about it, but I, I like the uh, I, I like the presentation basically of, of the idea and I think it's kind of it's kind of it's pretty testable um, you know he he, he looked he went into some good data with uh, with the rats where the experiments were you know pre- pretty decent so I don't know something to, to explore I don't think I'll be taking the sterculia oil quite quite uh, quite uh, yet but um, I'll certainly be listening to <laughs> what he reports from it long term yeah, the idea about the thermogenesis is actually really interesting because it is, like you said, measurable. And anything that is raising your temperature like that, well, it seems really interesting um, as a possibility that, that that's what it's doing and that it's having long-term um, metabolic effects that could be favorable for, for weight loss, certainly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I actually asked him um, if he expects that mechanism to be sort of counterbalanced homeostatically, because I gave him the example of um, if so, for, so I run very hot, right? I just, I produce a lot of heat. Uh, you know, I walk outside and it's, it's really cold and I'm in a shirt. Uh, I just, I just run warmer than the, the average person. And, but that's not making me lose weight all the time, right? I'm maintaining or even gaining in, in some cases if I manage to, to put on um, um, some, some weight. So there, there's always something that's counterbalancing it. And it's kind of, it's a, it's a really simple idea in a sense that you just take something like berberine and if you dose it properly, slowly and slowly you'll lose. But that seems counterintuitive to me. So I asked him what he, what he thought about it. And I think... We don't know for sure right now, but it could be that you have to couple, you know, a couple of things like low linoleic acid diet, add the sterculia oil on top. Um, I don't know, make sure you don't, uh, uh, you know, do too many other things at once. Otherwise, the allostatic load is too big and then, I don't know, the effect dissipates or something. So I I don't know how he's going to handle that, having to stack a few different interventions at once to, to make this work. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, and I think it comes up, and people don't consider it enough when we're talking about any kind of intervention. I always, when when I think about homeostatic uh, re-regulation like that, I always think about the antidepressants that I was put on for for many years because it seems to me like if you're going to mess around with the 
the <laughs> the amount of uh, neurotransmitters that are available, I think very quickly, if your body has an idea of how much it wants in, in the synapse, then it's going to adjust immediately or essentially immediately to mm -hmm. whatever you, you do to that. And so not only in the long-term sense would I expect it not to have any good effect, but now you've retrained all of your your neurons and synapses to what they expect. And I'm, not, I'm just not sure that that's a healthy thing to do long-term. Yeah, it's it's really it's really quite quite complex. I have to say, uh, weight loss is presented as such a uh, a fundamentally simple issue because it all comes down to a cal caloric deficit, but it so clearly doesn't because the ways in which they're induced matter. I mean, just today I was reading some studies where they were seeing the the caloric deficits when they were induced by uh, studies who just uh, exercise people they were doing five days of aerobic exercise um, in a week and it was it amounted to i think 500 uh, um, calories ex expended extra per day which was 2500 over the week and yeah. it and it came out to, to basically these people didn't have the down regulation in resting metabolic rate that other studies did for the equivalent amount of restriction that was happening through diet so okay. the, the depending on how you create the deficit, the signal is going to change the way you adapt to it, and it's sort of this very it's a very basic point about like weight regulation and body composition regulation, and yet we always talk about deficits in absolute terms, and we we totally <laughs> miss how it's happening, and this brings yeah. us back to what we we're saying about the stacking berberine plus low linoleic acid diet and all these different things and. And, you know, is it going to work too well? Is it going to make you lose too much energy and then your RMR is going to come down and, and then, you know, you have to dose it right, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess the good thing is it leaves lots of experimentation ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, you brought up, um, you brought up antipsychotics and that's those are the the subject of my of my research at the moment so i'm looking at uh, olanzapine and aripiprazole which are second generation uh, antipsychotics and i'm looking at what they're doing to the brain of these rats that that i had uh, that i used for for experiments and we're going to try to figure out you know how their memory change and how the presence of certain cells indicate you know neurogenesis or or neuronal death and stuff like that and to me, these these compounds are they're kind of disappointing. I mean, when you read about their history, they're they're both you can imagine why at the time they would have been viewed as semi miraculous, I guess, because they 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 finally managed to press a lever and something changed, and they were probably <laughs> so happy about managing to do that that they didn't really care what happened after that. <laughs> it seems that. <laughs> The, the what came after that was well you know people are sort of less less we don't know what we don't know how to define it there may be less many different things but they're but they're not necessarily uh getting better and i think it's been such a, a literature that's fraught with contradictory results you know a lot like the nutrition literature and a lot of hidden negative results and and hyped up positive results so I guess oh, my, yeah. my first question is what, because I've never taken antidepressants. Um, I've taken psychotropic drugs, but I've never taken in, you know, a pharmaceutical antidepressant. So, um, and, yeah, and, let me tell and, you a bit and, about my experience. Yeah, tell me that. about it, because my experience, the drug effects that I've experienced, like caffeine or alcohol or pot, they're very immediate. And it's a mm -hmm. matter of minutes, but antidepressants are very different. So I'm curious to learn about that. Well, it's funny that you say that because when I was first diagnosed with depression, when I was 20, I was given Prozac, um, which is um, supposed to, if you read the literature, it's, it's supposed to take a couple of weeks to act um, like, like you've said. But my experience uh, with Prozac in particular was that right after I took it the first time, I felt like I had taken LSD. Like wow. I can remember very clearly walking down the hall in the university and just feeling this surreality, a bit of time slowing down. There was a grin on my face I could not remove. 
<laughs> and it, it was it was kind of intense and that wow. didn't last very long it lasted i don't know maybe a couple of hours it was a long time ago and it never appeared again um but other than that initial very intense prominent beginning i'm not even sure that it had any kind of effect on my mood at all that i could perceive um and, and i took it for probably over a decade. I, I stopped and started a couple of times because I, I got frustrated thinking, why am I even taking this drug? And then mm -hmm. of course, because my depression kept coming back, I would end up back at the psychiatrist and she would ask, or he would ask, you know, are you taking your medicine? And I'd say no. And so they'd start me on it again. Um, but then uh, I don't know if you know, but I was re-diagnosed with bipolar type two mm -hmm, in, yeah in my thirties. And when that happened, actually my first response was, oh, this is wonderful because it, mm. it gives me a reason to understand why the antidepressant wasn't working for me because it was the wrong, it was treating the wrong condition. Um, <laughs> now I don't think that, but at the time that's what I thought. Now I think the antidepressant probably actually kindled the bipolar. Uh, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. even sure if I would have ever come up with bipolar if I hadn't been on antidepressants for so long. That's the way I view it now. But then right. I tried some bipolar medications and and none of them were very helpful either, it turned out, and all of them had terrible side effects. I don't remember which side effects go with which ones, but I, I know I took mm -hmm. Lamotrigine and another anticonvulsant. And one of them gave me... Um, what they call brain zaps. It's just the sensation that there's this shock going mm. down the back of your head. And, but the other one was even worse. It gave me um, word recall problems. I started to feel like I was like having dementia. Wow. I was losing my mind. So I got off that one and I tried Seroquel mm. and that kind of turned me into a zombie. I basically couldn't get out of bed. I had no energy whatsoever. Mm. And, but the, the one that I tried that you've already mentioned is Aripiprazole. And what that did to me. That Abilify, was, right? Yes. And gave yeah, me yeah. intense anxiety like I'd never oh experienced before. Um, we ended up having to titrate the amount down to mm. a very low doses. I don't remember compared to, it was much lower than a normal default dose. And at that point, it seemed like maybe mm. it was helping, maybe it wasn't. It was hard to tell. But right. it was at that point that I found the carnivore diet and, and got off all meds. And that was, you know, off the roller coaster. Yeah. What was the other one you mentioned? O Olanzapine? O Olanzapine, which is Zyprexa, I think. Okay. What, so yeah. what do you know about the, the effects? You talked about memory. I'm really interested in memory. And I'm wondering what you've learned about those drugs in those terms. Uh, to be honest, unfortunately, I've, if I'm being, yeah, if I'm being, I'll, I'll be blunt. I don't think I've learned that much. And the problem is the model that we used to study our rats is called the MAM uh, model, which is the methyl azoxymethanol acetate uh, in utero model that you, so you inject the pregnant mothers with this chemical, which is a uh, cytotoxic and it affects the development of the baby rats. And then they're born uh, as a schizophrenic uh, model. So I had a control group wow. and a schizophrenic one uh, that was developed this way. But I'm very skeptical of what it tells us about the, uh, the model, first of all. And I'm very unsure of how to interpret the effects because what I've seen in my data is I haven't seen a lot of, basically it's interesting. I have, so basically what I've noticed so far is that whether you're made schizophrenic as a rat or you're on any of those drugs, your short-term memory and cognition are, are worsened. Okay. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I seem to have found so far, which is gonna be very hard to publish. Um, <laughs> they're not gonna like that. And I've only had in the females a change in long-term memory where the olanzapine group, not, not just so in the control olanzapine group, meaning they were not schizophrenic, they just took olanzapine. They didn't do too well with the long-term memory. Um, so that's like one of my Scary. only statistically significant <laughs> results in the, in the long-term, uh, novel object recognition test that I, I, I did with them. And I have to tell you it, it doing this PhD has crumbled my trust in a lot of basic behavioral neuroscience, because I think a lot of the tests are, 
there's nothing wrong with them inherently. They're just so limited in what they're made to, to tell us. And, but these results are extrapolated so far. Uh, like the, one of the tests I did is called uh, the short-term novel object recognition test. And basically it's just trying to see if the rat can distinguish between a novel object and uh, two identical ones that he, that he was used to. Uh, and that's and by how, how much, much they pay attention? Yeah, basically they should spend uh, more time with the novel object because this is a cue for no, like, basically we don't know if it's a cue for short-term memory or if it's for cognition because you need to understand if the object is new and you need to remember that, it, that right, there's both of components and, and uh, this is not made clear to me what I should be calling it. So I'm just calling it whatever. And I'm thinking, well, that kind of matters when you're talking about what it's likely to do for humans in a sense. I don't know, it seems sort of, True. there's a big jump there in how we, we test the safety of those, of those drugs. And uh, um, yeah, my model didn't confirm a lot of the, a lot of the, I would say the accepted research that these drugs rescue a lot of the memory deficits. That's one of the things that are shown. So I don't know, maybe I messed the model up or those drugs didn't save the deficits as is usually proclaimed. I honestly don't know at this stage. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. Yeah, that's, it's a problem. I think even in, in my field, which was at one point computational linguistics, I know a lot of graduate students were having trouble replicating results. Like you'd start and say, okay, to start my project, I'm going to build on something that somebody else has done. And then, so your first job is to replicate that and then build on it. And then so a lot of people would find they're getting stuck on just the replication and and we don't know if that's because we don't have certain parameters just right or if the the data was was so specific that it only works on this type of data and not that type of data and and i think yeah, yeah exactly right that it's the extrapolations from very specific experiments that are maybe being pushed too widely yeah. in our understanding you know, I'll give you a, a good example of, of over extrapolation. So, um, well, not over extrapolation, but I guess not, not being rigorous enough. So I was presenting my project to my, some colleagues the other day. It's one of these online presentations because we can't meet during COVID. So I was presenting my work and the first question I got was, but did you measure the uh, uh, metabolites of the compounds in the uh, in the plasma to make sure your rats actually got a certain level. I said no, <laughs> I did I didn't, and we should have. Um, but uh, thankfully, I did manage to get the ketogenic diet in that experiment where we could measure the effect of the intervention in one case. So um, it's funny to me how that wasn't a, a big deal in how the project was was formed. Like I, I would have preferred to prioritize interventions where you can cheaply easily measure the concentration you know in the, the intervention and yet we're prioritizing the study of drugs where if we were to do it right it would cost much more much more and we might not do it and i right. think you know there's the financial incentive and there's the ubiquity of the drugs and there's all these reasons besides the fact that it's, sometimes it's easier to do better science asking different questions away from those <laughs> mainstream drugs yes. you know yes yeah so it's, um, I don't know, psychiatry, I'm, I'm, I'm no psychiatrist. I've never seen patients or even, you know, uh, shadowed a, a psychiatrist seeing patients. But um, I think we have such great technology, but we're mostly asking the wrong questions. And same thing in nutrition, actually. Um, I think the problem, like, if we, if we return back to, if we jump back to nutrition, uh, a lot of people say, well, we can't uh, uh, double blind it and placebo the diet. And that's true. To, it's mostly true, except when you do shakes. Um, but I don't think that's such the limitation that people think it is, actually. I think if we ask much better questions, like trying to establish dietary basics, um, like kind of like what Kevin Hall did in his latest study with the plant-based and meat-based diet. I mean, it was an attempt at that, uh, uh, actually. So if we ask those ba more basic kind of questions, I think we'd quickly be able to you know, design better studies with asking better questions with less subjective, you know, criteria for, for evaluating it, you know. Um, so yeah. it's, it's not a technological problem, you know, in my mind. 
<laughs> I like that idea. I think that you're right about questions in, in every frontier in science. With, when a scientific field advances, it's because somebody stepped back and decided to reformulate the question in a way that was more uh, productive. Uh, nutrition's interesting though, because in, in the wild, like you can learn all these things about the effects of different nutritional compounds, but then in the wild, you've got this whole feedback loop of what, what the person responds with when you change something. So, so for example, we, we like to talk about in the low carb community, how the, how a low carb diet will affect satiety. So all of a sudden you, you don't, or most people in, in many cases don't need to then try to additionally uh, restrict calories because as soon as they're eating this way, the, the access to your fat cells maybe is providing more fat. And so you're naturally getting this satiety from your own body. And so it seems to me there, there are lots of nutritional factors that you can change that are going to have an effect on what the person then wants to do <laughs> that, that you won't necessarily be able to tell if you're doing actually the, the correct scientific thing, which is to really restrict all the other factors. Because in real life, when you change one factor, all the other factors actually may change in a way that you, mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily predict, especially if you're going to hold them constant on purpose. Yeah, it's... Um... I'm, I'm yeah I'm very I'm very uncomfortable with the whole satiety satiation conversation because um, I know that it matters to 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 some degree right clearly um, it's the sort of thing that when you don't have it you you long for it and you it's like super obvious to you how important it is to have your appetite controlled but when yeah. when it's not a problem when you're maintaining an adequate body composition you never think of it. And I think it's, it's, there's this weird, nearly like reverse bias where there are so few people, I think, who have a normal relationship to their appetite. Um, and not just people who are overweight, by the way. This, this could be compulsive, you know, binge eaters, uh, people with anorexia. I'm talk, you know, the average person who, who will have McDonald's at 3 a.m. and feel sick the next day. Like, I'm talking every, everyone. It's very rare, I think, for people to know... Um, that you should stop eating not out of discomfort, but out of uh, an urge in, in essence. And it's to put the fork down and it's also not to pick it up an hour later. It's also to, to not have that initiation come back uh, at the wrong time too early or something like that. And not too late either, right? Um, and I think, it, I don't know, I, I feel like it's nearly, it pertains more to nearly to neuroscience and psychiatry, that whole conversation. And I think that the, it, at the moment, the more fruitful endeavors, just, just look at, at changes in, like in fat mass when you have some objective correlates in the blood, like, I don't know, ketone levels or, or changes in calorimetry. And that will tell you a lot. Like, we don't have to anchor it to this uh, satiety index, which is just, I don't know what to do with that right, right now. Like, well, maybe know. in a way, satiety is... <laughs> It's almost the end result. Uh, one argument that I sometimes make about deficit is that if you're losing weight, then you're obviously in a caloric deficit. So to say, put yourself in a caloric deficit is already mm -hmm. like asking you to do the end, <laughs> do what you're, right. what you're trying to prove, right? And maybe satiety is kind of the same way. So yes, you want a, a, a diet that regulates satiety to the point where you are the exact optimal weight that you want, but you can't know that that's happened until your weight has regularized. So I'm not sure, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe what you're saying is that it's, you can't really focus on that because focusing on that is the same as focusing on the end result. Yeah, in a, in a sense, I mean, you, of course, I think you and I would both recommend to someone learn to pay attention to what keeps you full and, you know, be mindful that when you eat, I don't know, a candy bar, you're hungry an hour later. So in that basic sense, yeah, we are saying pay attention to some basic how, how you're feeling. But that's very different than sort of this like maximize satiety using, I don't know whether it's uh, volume or whether it's 
essentially <laughs> nausea when people do it with protein. I mean, if you really do fill up with lean chicken breast, I don't know, is that, is that really being full or is that just being like sort of put off by something that's just, pa pa it's just not palatable. It's just, you know, that's, I don't know. It's not the same thing for me. For me, if something works, meaning you're hungry, it's desirable. And then it stops being desirable. So it has to have both of those yes. quality to be uh, to be functional in a sense, right? It has to, that's normal. You, you need this, this oscillation of hunger. And I think we're, that's missed from the whole satiety discussion. We're just like cranking up the volume levers and the, the sort of just, <laughs> just doesn't taste good. And that, I don't think that's, I don't think we're getting to anything fundamental by doing that. I think that's it's a, a bit really of false hope in a sense, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe someone like Tyler Cartwright, uh, who who lost a ton of weight, is like, dude, you're you're full of shit. I'm sorry. It took it took a discipline, and you grit your teeth. And at some, you know, I can't. I'm not going to tell him that that wasn't the case for him. I can't tell say say that. But yeah, the scientific question is different. In my mind. Yeah. And of course, when you start talking about individual responses, then. You know, there could be things that they're dealing with from past or from spe very specifics of their medical history or medical condition that would make one thing harder or easier than another. Although, you know, I never want to make it sound like I don't like the, the reductionism of bioindividuality because I think it's important right. to recognize that we're all the same species and that if we have differences, they're going to be usually minor and they're usually going to be in in, in very specific things that we can't, like if I have an allergy, for example, then of course I have to pay attention to that. But I, I prefer if we, if our theories at least mm -hmm. will predict something for most people to be the same. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very much undervalued. There's all the precision medicine and the, the coaching apps. And this is a discussion I had with my team that, you know, we had this, we were writing up some marketing materials for the app and we were like, oh, it's this sort of coach. I'm like, but, but we're not though. We're not actually coaching. Like <laughs> we're, we're, we're bringing some valuable stuff, some valuable metrics for people to be organized and, and that's good, but we're not actually coaching. We're, we're applying some things that are pretty like, it's, it's kind of like you would do for an RDI. We're like, well, this is going to cover 90, 95% of our customers. And you're going to have 5% on one end and 5% on the other or something that it, it's just not going to be enough. But most people are going to find so much benefit in some universal principles, uh, which is like avoiding the stuff that this is how I explained it to Brad. when we We're talking about weight loss, fat loss and insulin sensitivity. For me, you have two dials. You have it's all about insulin signaling. So you have on the one side, you have crank up the insulin, hyperinsulinemia. So that's like sugar, uh, flour, all that crap. And on the other end, you have just super sensitized the fat cell with linoleic acid with like omega-6. <laughs> and if you can, if you right. can combine that in fried food, boom, perfect. Like you're, you're, you're off to the races. Um, so, so that's how I see it. That's, I don't, I, I fail to find situations where that's just not true in a sense that you just will accumulate more fat. Yeah. And until I see that change, I'm, I'm going to have to, default to that very basic reproducible facts of fat accumulation. I have a question about your app and insulin, actually. I noticed recently uh, there, you have an article about the insulin index. Do you have mm -hmm. insulin index charts in your app? So we have, so we have, we give the insulin index for the comparison of food from zero to hundred percent. So just a, mm -hmm. a figure. And then if you click on, for example, your insulin load, which will calculate for your day, then you'll see a chart where, where that is graphed. But it's not, it's not the insulin index chart that where you have like all your different foods, you know, following a, a linear relationship. It's not, it's not that, but it's just like a personal tracking, uh, tracking graph. I'm really, I'm interested in that because, because it seems like it's, it's a small part of the picture um, because you can't tell what the glucagon response is at the same time. So yeah. for example, I think beef has a very high insulin index, but maybe, maybe beef compared to egg would, yes, yeah. have more of an insulin response. But, but if you don't know what the glucagon response is at the same time, it's hard to predict 
how that's going to affect yeah. what happens in the liver, for example. Yeah, that was a really that was a difficult problem when when developing the score because I know we, I knew we had to adjust for protein, um, but it's but it, but you can't just like you don't know exactly where to where to put it. So you you sort of have to basically. And this I'm not at all a machine learning person. This is all uh, my my colleague Thomas did this. <laughs> right, you are. So you you understand this way better than me, but. Basically, the way I explain it is that you make all sorts of guesses, and then those mm -hmm. guesses have to match up with the empirical data set that you start with, and then you sort of adjust and improve the predict predictivity of the model. Uh, if you know some biology, basically, and, you, and assuming it's right, of course, that you input that into your model. So we tried to do that. Um, and I played around, like just you know, selecting different diets and looking at the insulin load. And so the thing is, it doesn't it seems relatively within what you would predict sort of that protein has this sort of intermediate role it doesn't come out as much as glucose but it counts more than fat sort of thing um, but the thing is you don't know what to anchor it to we still don't know what to tell people in terms of this should be your insulin load i can't i can't give you an exact number so we don't have that in the app and we're trying to figure out okay even if we don't know how can we how can we guide the the customers towards how, how can they figure out their own insulin load rather right. than us giving them a pre uh, a presumed insulin load and we haven't figured and it you out know yet, but, uh, there's another big problem that that occurs to me when you talk about that too and that's that the insulin response is going to be different if you're if you're on a ketogenic yeah. diet than if you're not yeah. and i don't know if like if you take like a few foods and you have maybe some like differences uh, in those foods, maybe those differences will stay the same, but the scale might mm -hmm. be might be different. Oh yeah, yeah, and this is this is why we've been sort of like hankering for for data. Basically, we've been reaching out to so many doctors and clinics who are using CGMs or a weight scale, you know, or bioimpedance scale or whatever sort of basic anthropometric uh, anthropo uh, yeah, metric measure you can use, and just start to figure out like how it's correlating for people um yeah. we we don't have that it's kind of crazy to me like these are such basic questions we should start figuring out and of course if you can have type 1 diabetics then you're actually like you you get the benefit not having to go to a lab and draw blood because you can actually figure out how much insulin someone had to inject so right that's a you really can use all sort idea. of like uh <laughs> if you can get the right population you can do like things a little more uh they're a little more interesting so i i hope we get to do that at some point so people out there or universe may, make it happen if, uh, <laughs> if i can get some help <laughs> you know even having an insulin meter would be a big technological leap i think yeah oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i hope um metabolic or or we're making progress on that end. I'd love to see that. That'd be a nice uh, change for 2021. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be some good news. Um, so uh, you have a new website. You, you've revamped the website. You should tell people about it and what you have up there and, and what's, oh, and, and your book, of course. You have to, have to tell us about your book and all of that. And, and we'll, we'll jump on something that, that comes up from that. Thank you for asking about those. Yeah, so when I first started writing, when I, I got my own blog, I was really hesitant to talk about the carnivore diet because it just seemed so out there. And, and really all we had was anecdotes and, and my personal experience. And I didn't wanna make it sound like I was claiming that we know, for example, like I have this personal experience of the carnivore diet putting my bipolar disorder into remission. And I didn't want anyone to mistake me for saying the carnivore diet does this because we just don't have enough information. So, uh, but on the other hand, I also had been researching about the ketogenic diet for a long time and had a lot of things I wanted to write about that. And the things that I was writing about that were based on pretty solid scientific studies that had been happening for decades. And so, Originally, I made two blogs to make it really clear that these were separate mm -hmm. things. One that was supposed to be very scientific and everything I say here is going to be very based in lit scientific literature. And then this personal experience and weird out there idea about the carnivore diet, which 
there were people doing it, but in a certain sense, you could say no one was doing it, you know? Right. <laughs> um, there were some of us. Um, but then, so then when I first started speaking, my first speaking gig was at the Ancestral Health Symposium, and I was talking about uh, weaning babies onto meat and how we shouldn't worry about that because babies already have this ketogenic based metabolism and and they don't need to have a big injection of carbohydrates because they're they're doing just fine that was the basis of that talk and um i, I so i had lots of things i wanted to say yeah. again with that split about all these things i knew about ketogenic diets um, and then this weird personal thing that I wasn't sure I wanted to talk about. <laughs> but as soon as I started <laughs> speaking, everyone wanted to know about this carnivore thing. And so finally I relented. And in, <laughs> so I guess 2017, I spoke at KetoFest and at KetoCon and gave this basic story of what I'm doing and what it did for me. And mm -hmm. after that happened, people started coming up to me or writing to me and telling me how important um, this knowledge had been for their life and how they had benefited from it and how grateful they were mm -hmm. for me sharing this. And so then I realized, okay, I'm going to have to keep talking about this. Right. <laughs> and so eventually, you know, I had to give in and say, okay, yes, these are separate ideas, but I might as well put it all in one place. And so my new blog where that has everything is called mostlyfat.com. I made up a, a slogan. That's so kind funny. Of, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I wanted so to, unapologetic. To tease. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to tease Michael Pollan because you know he has this uh, yeah. this saying: uh, eat eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And mm -hmm. so I turned that into eat meat, <laughs> not too little, <laughs> and mostly <Yeah>. fat. <laughs> Yeah, much better, much much better. Yeah, it's a t it's a totally different worldview. It's funny in those in those two summations you have uh, you have people who'd probably agree on so much if they sat down for lunch. I'm sure, you know, appreciation yeah. for food and uh, all sorts of overlapping interests. Yet you couldn't be like you're on two different tectonic plates when it comes to food in that sense. You know, there's, <laughs> one is about moderation and some sort of asceticism and the other is about maybe something more primal and more bountiful. There's something more, yeah, again, unapologetic about it where it's like, no, this is our, our due and that's how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be rich and, and, and tasty and feel really good because it's, it's what keeps you alive. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, you could say that the fact that it tastes good is an indication that that's what we're adapted for. <laughs> right. I mean, you, right. there are limits to that argument because you could make the same argument about yeah. processed sugar, right? But <laughs> that's yeah. for different reasons, I think. Yeah. I think that's because of its rarity, in fact. Yeah, and it's not the same. There is there is a there is something when when you eat really really good f food, and then you can eat like I don't know. Let's say you have. So I was I was watching this Netflix show. Uh, I think it was called. Um, uh, I, can't, I think it was chef's table or something like that. And I thought it was going to be some sort of stupid cooking comp competitive show. And it turned out to be this really well-made, you know, one uh, character, an episode, an exploration of someone's life story and food. And the first episode was this Italian butcher uh, who his restaurant was known just for a Florentine steak. And it, it, the food he cooked was that's what you ate when you were there. There's not a thousand other things and it was served with nothing else. You just served the steak and with salt. That's it. Glass of wow. wine. And there's no, there's no second, first dessert. None of that. It's, that's what you come here for. And it was just a really well made uh, uh, documentary. And for me, the taste you experience from that is, is, is fundamentally different than tasting like a popsicle. <laughs> like it's not the same there is it, it in one it harkens back to something deep and and kind of ineffable it's very hard to explain but it's it's familiar the other is more like separate surprising chemical synthetic um uh, different it's it's one is not one is taste but the other is food you know and yeah. the, the taste from real 
the, the taste from things that interact with your taste receptors are just not the same. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of the when you were talking about testing novelty. I think the sensation of having like a popsicle, something very sweet, is you pay a lot of attention to it in the same way that you would pay attention to a novelty stimulus. Whereas when, mm. at least for me, when I'm eating meat, the sensation is like a kind of deep bodily satisfaction. Yeah, it's, um, I guess we, we would ask, have to ask someone with lots of introspection, maybe a Buddhist, <laughs> to describe <laughs> that more, more fully, because I can't quite put my finger on it. But it's, it's, it's different. It's like if you inhale like an e-cigarette, which is like has raspberry and tasting and crunching on a raspberry, it's, you have something in common, but one is food and the other just is not. And it's fundamentally different in that sense. So yeah, I don't know how we got onto that, but. Um, <laughs> well, you we, asked we me about my book. Fat. And yeah. so I wanted to also say uh, just a little oh, bit yeah. about that. Um, I've been wanting to write a book for a very long time. Initially, actually, I wanted to write a book about all the different therapies that a ketogenic diet would be good for. But as I got more and more into this carnivore realm, I decided that that would be where, where I could make the best contribution. And I decided that I wanted to write it uh, online to give people access to it. And so I've, I've been dropping a chapter at a time onto the mm -hmm. website for the book, which is called, so the website's called Facultative Carnivore. That was originally what I was gonna call the mm -hmm. book. When I announced that, a bunch of people said, you can't have that name. It's too weird and complex. <laughs> but <laughs> I did end up changing it to that slogan, Eat Meat, Not Too Little, Mostly Fat, is now the name of the book. <laughs> too. But what I wanted to do with that book is, first of all, describe why I would want to talk about it, so a bit about my story, but then all the different, just break down all the different reasons or things that I've learned throughout the time that I have been eating this diet, things about, oh, what we think we know about vegetables that aren't true and what we think we know about the mm -hmm. human um, as, as an evolved being and, and whether they should be eating meat or not and, and all the history of, of our evolution and where that came from. And then uh, um, chapters that I haven't yet released have to do with how, how we nourish our bodies and the, the history of carnivore diet ideas in the past and, and, and a little bit of ethics too, because I think that's an important topic to get to. Oh, nice. Yeah, let's, let's touch on that at some point. And uh, just, I'm not even keeping track of time. So if at any point you have to, you have to jump, just, uh, just interrupt me. But um, okay. uh, I, can go I a actually wanted longer. to ask you what, um, say for whatever reason, a mother can't breastfeed. What, according to you, should she be feeding her infant? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I mean, so ideally is your own breast milk. And then second best would be somebody else's breast milk. Right. So there, I know that there are collectives that you can possibly get some if you're having problems. I have a friend who made a great use of that. Um, if you can't do that, well, it's, it's difficult because uh, there's so many factors that go into breast milk itself, even even formulas that are very conscientious in trying to put in all the factors. I don't think they have discovered everything yet. <laughs> um, when I, when I had my last child, he wasn't weaned, but there was a time when I had to go away. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I had him given was uh, a, basically a recipe I, that I adapted from a Weston Price article, which is mm -hmm. using goat milk because it had some caprylic acid that is more like right. human milk and proteins. Maybe the profile is a little more like humans. Mm -hmm. Plus some, I added some uh, coconut oil also to improve that fatty acid profile. But at that right. time he was already eating some solid foods. So it wasn't something that he would, it would be the whole basis of his diet. And I'm not sure uh, I haven't really looked into what I would do to make sure that someone was getting that complete thing because there are things like, for example, taurine is um, it's a conditionally essential 
amino acid. Mm -hmm. But in infants, it's actually not conditionally essential. They don't have the ability to make it yet. Even in adults, mm -hmm. arguably, we don't have the ability to make as much as would be ideal. I think that okay. we, uh, uh, you know, from an adaptation perspective, probably expected to get some amount from the diet and some amount from our own synthesis, but babies can't synthesize it. And I don't know that goat milk might not have taurine in it. So that's like just one example of many examples right. of things that you might want to make sure that they're getting. Yeah, I was, uh, I don't know that I had that question in my, in my head for some reason, because I find infant nutrition fascinating. Um, and I, I, was, I, was, I also thought of it because I was watching your Lipivore uh, uh, YouTube video the other day where you were talking about infant nutrition and infant fatness. And I found that, I found it hilarious that we're fatter than baby, in, like infants are fatter than baby seals. That's, that's too, too rich. I love it. I love it. It's, yeah, it gives a good image, I think. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, that's really the sort of thing that that should be more of a like, wait, what? This would be not a, you know, this should be a big question of, I would say, maybe even anatomy or physiology for, for you know, people who are looking at interspecies comparison. Um, like, why are we so fat? There, there must be a reason. And I think like, like you were arguing that the brain has a lot to do with that. Um, yeah. Well, and I should say a lot of that idea that that I was talking about for infants in particular is is all Kunain that I'm channeling Stephen Kunain yeah. because he, oh, he's great. You know, he even he's has a, a whole book on on it's called uh, Survival of the Fattest, but he's talking specifically about infants and how that was mm -hmm. necessary for them. And and I think what what I added to it or contributed to that idea is that it's not just infants, even though we become much leaner, actually human humans, you think of a, like a really lean athletic human, and that's already way more body fat than you would expect just for a primate. Um, it's normalized yeah. to us. It's, it's <laughs> so true. I was, I'm thinking, I swear at my, my local CrossFit box, you can see, so of course, so the, the girls wear, you know, these tops that are, that are like big bras, basically these sport tops. Yeah. So, so, and these short shorts and the guys are without shirts and you're like, these people are like pretty ripped and, and stuff. And, and you look and you compare, it's like even the, the leanest female that I know is like so fat compared to the next, uh, you know, animal you can name or, or primate. It's just amazing. Um, even when we, you could say, even when we artificially manage to lower it, I guess uh, for some, for some people I'm thinking of who are like some women who, who don't, who, who start to take on that V shape because they're so lean and, and muscular rather than the hourglass shape. Uh, even they are just way, way fatter than, uh, than, uh, yeah, well, to be animal. concrete, like, a, I think a male gorilla body fat is, I think it's less than 1%. Like, yeah, we're yeah, talking ridiculous. a whole order of magnitude. Ridiculous. Yeah. It's nearly like they have one, like, it's like we have an extra organ, come to think of it. I mean, in, yeah, in that's relative exactly. Terms. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Because yeah. you have to imagine there's, I think so, it does come back to the brain, and I'm sure most of it's going to be there, but I can't help to think it might have to do something, uh, have something to do with our immune system. And I couldn't justify that beyond some gut intuition. But it has such a profound effect on the immune system, the, the fat tissue. That that's I, true. And there I are specialized fat there. tissue that's more immune, like visceral fat, right, is, is an immune right. organ. And even yeah. if it's a different kind of fat or distributed differently, there's got to be commonalities and communication between them, probably. Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, what, um, here, here's a, a broad question for you. Uh, how have you seen the the carnivore scene evolve over the past five years? Because we've had, <laughs> you know, what's really interesting. We've had Paul Saladino quote platform someone like Peter um, from Hyperlibid, which I think is is wonderful in a sense. I'm I'm so happy that these <laughs> ideas are getting uh, me too into a lot of ears. It's really cool. Um, me too. But it also then you also see a lot more attacks from the mainstream, from like Rhonda Patrick, who's like defending her sulfur, <laughs> sulforaphane and people are getting in a tizzy over that. I find it kind of funny, actually. It's not a, 
I, I'm, it's not in bad taste or anything, but I was just wondering, what did you make of the whole evolution and how it's being received? It's, it's been funny to watch, you know, because you said five years. So 2015, that was, yeah. I'm sure, before Sean Baker got on board. Um, he had a huge influence in bringing awareness of the carnivore diet. And mm -hmm. I would say, so I, w I started going to low carb conferences around 2016. And at that time, um, I can remember going up to the mic and saying things about the non necessity of fiber, the non necessity of plants and, and my, I was, I think I was received as being really out there and, and very controversial but within the space of about two years, instead of um, me having to go up to the mic with that, all of the people who every, I can remember there, it might've been low carb USA in 2017 or 18. Um, I felt like every, after every speaker, there was at least one question about the carnivore diet. And that was the moment where I said, okay, the time for this has come. And that's when I decided to have the carnivore conference. So I guess that was the summer of 2018 because that's when I planned the conference for the following year. And speaking about the conference, I just have to say I was so, um, I'm really glad that Peter Dobromilski is getting attention, but I was so jealous because I had him lined up as a speaker at the oh, conference. No. And he, that was going to oh, be, no. um, it was great revelation. Look, I got Peter to speak. And then, and then Paul Saladino got him first. So I was, I was so That's mad hilarious. That. That's so funny you say that because I had exactly the same reaction. I, well, I didn't have him booked for anything, but I was like, God damn it. <laughs> I thought it was always going to be me. <laughs> I always thought it was going to be me. And, and I get all the credit. <laughs> yeah, I guess great minds else. think alike. We all want to take yeah. credit for Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but good. Uh, look, at, look, I'm glad because the, the ideas, if anything, have merit to be criticized. <laughs> That's the least we can say. And that would yes. be really cool if it, if it rustle, ruffles some feathers and gets people thinking. Because I know he's had direct contact with some very respectful researchers like uh, Dave Speyer, who's looking at mitochondria. And you can just tell that, like, why isn't Peter in the lab? Like, there's just no good reason for a guy like this not to be running his own lab. And I, I, I swear that I fantasize about funding him <laughs> and just saying, look, yeah. you can kayak in the morning but just give me your <laughs> afternoon and, and here are 20 postdocs and just ask some questions. Like those are the people I want uh, advancing some of the science we have, we have to do. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. well, one can always dream. So Rafi, I think I have to go. <laughs> yeah, it was a pleasure. It was really fun. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for meeting me today. It's good to see you too. It's been too long because I'm used to seeing you a couple of times a year. Yeah. Well, at least a couple of times in the last couple of years, but. Exactly. So let's not, let's not break that streak too long. So fingers crossed COVID uh, lets up and uh, I can make it back to Boulder. And uh, yeah, hopefully for the conference. Now that would be, now that'd be the best if I could come for the conference. That's yeah, I've been best. hesitating on setting the new date because everything just seems really unpredictable, but hopefully yeah. this summer it'll be good. Yeah, fingers crossed. So everyone, if um, you know, if you're if you're listening and intent on going to the conference, stay tuned for that. Do, you, do they have an email they can sign up to or or something for news about that? To have someone um, or I'll make one. I'll make one. Okay. <laughs> I don't <perfect>. right now. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. All right. So stay tuned. Follow Amber on Twitter. <laughs> thanks Rafi. all right thanks bye-bye